Hello, I'm Sarah. This is Heart of the Hearts. And this is my week of reading wrap up where I talk about the books that I read this week, what I'm currently reading, and then potentially could read next week based on my mood. Uh, I had a phenomenal reading week. Uh, a lot of it is in, due in part to Shorty September, which I'll talk about as we go through. But basically, it's a reading challenge that's hosted by Past Story Time, which is Bert and Shawnee, and then also by Heather at Soggy Expat Book Nerd. And they put together this really fun a little challenge with prompts and all to read Nessa's novellas and all these different kinds of novellas. Uh, I think novellas may be my favorite kind of reading uh, because I, I like that the the act of condensing, but I but I like them more than short stories. So I'm just delighted to be participating. So you'll see a few of those in here. Let's get straight to it because I have a lot to talk about. So the first book that I read, uh, number one, my book is literally falling apart. Yeah, I know. Oh, so such a, I mean, not, not like this cover is anything to, to keep uh, and to, to mourn because it's kind of hideous. Uh, but, you know, it's kind of, I was kind of bereft when I was in so I'm, I'm reading it like this uh, to, so it doesn't actually do what it did and, and separate. Uh, all right, so let's talk about this book. This is uh, volume two of the Alberta trilogy by Cora Sandell. I was starting this for Women in Translation Month. Uh, this is the trilogy is translated by Elizabeth uh, Rat Rogan. When we left the first book, we had Alberta, a teenager uh, finishing school, ready to get out into the world and feeling overwhelmingly confined and trapped in her home village. And this is in the Gulf of Finland. And that's where we ended volume one. We do a massive leap in forward when we start this book. So in this book, she's in Paris, not a lot of detail as to how she arrived there. And she's nude modeling for a, an Englishman who is a painter and running with a bohemian set of artists and models and painters and the like. She's living in Montparnasse. She's, she lives in the very, very top, cheapest room of these small little hotels that she can possibly uh, afford. Uh, she's sparsely furnished. She's, her life is very little. There's little money, there's little food. She tells everyone that she's studying French and that's what she's, what she's there to do. But everyone tells her, your French is amazing. You speak almost like a local. And what they're really trying to say is, you're kind of not doing anything with your life. And she's, you know, she's so smart. She's so capable. She's so, so intelligent. But she's also very withdrawn and is avoiding any kind of connections, except for her girlfriends. And so she has a set of girlfriends that she spends time, a lot of time with. Uh, one that is a painter who also does some modeling, who's in love with a, an artist. And uh, they, so she's developed her own community of, of women that are, and some men are, that are in there. And she's avoiding trying any in any way coming into contact with any other Finns because she doesn't want anything to get back to her family or her village about how she's living her life. Uh, so, you know, she has a strong sense of independence and the strong sense that she wants to live how she wants to live. And we see the, the start of this bohemian uh, lifestyle that, that she is engaged in. But she is refusing to get involved with men. So all of her girlfriends and everyone she knows keeps trying to set her up and she just keeps pushing back and no, 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 no. And that becomes one of the themes of, of, uh, of her is, is when she, when is she going to, or will she, and what does she have to give up in order to, to be in love? Um, and watching what's happening with her friends as they're falling in love and the different modeling that she has of, of what love looks like in this environment in Paris. I will say that, I, you know, I liked, I definitely liked the book for sure. 
but it's a case where the context, I think, matters more than the content per se. And what I mean by that is, uh, I was so frustrated with Alberta because, as I said, she's so smart and she's so capable, uh, but she languishes and she allows herself to just kind of um, not do anything for her own survival. And so many people worry about her and are, are concerned because they also see it. So that was really frustrating. And she was, she would, every once in a while, she would pen uh, an essay or a story and send it off to, to the paper and they would publish it and give her some money. But she didn't do anything to create any kind of semblance of, of income that would give her any kind of, of security. And in lieu of that, people kept trying to push her toward men who would take care of her. Uh, so it's like you, you have to take care of yourself or someone else or allow someone else to do it. But ultimately... It, that became a very frustrating part for me to read. And I'm not sure if it's because I'm an American and we're like, you know, take care, you know, up for your bootstraps, Protestant work ethic kind of kind of stuff of that's been indoctrinated in me that was coming out. But it was hard. It was it was a struggle for me to read that. But it was only in retrospect when I think about and I went back to check when this was written. Now, this was written in 1931. And some of the topics and the themes that are in here are, are sh just shocking that she was able to get it written and published. Uh, uh, cho you know, choice is in here, like in terms of abortion, in terms of, of s sexual relationships and, and marriage outside of marriage. So much is in here that I can see this book being a beacon in the, in, in the darkness for women who wanted to just be free and to live their life as they wanted. Uh, and, you know, there's a romance in the poverty. There's a romance in the, in the scrap, scrappy way of living. So I see how this could be uh, such an important book for so many people. I'm very, very glad I read it. Uh, I have a feeling that the next <laughs> volume is going to be really bleak. But I will continue on because I do want to know what happens to Alberta. So that was the first one. The second book I finished makes me laugh because you'll notice a theme uh, unbeknownst to me. I didn't do this on purpose, but these titles are the longest titles ever. This one is Everyone Knows Your Mother is a Witch. And this is by Rivka Galchen. This was such a fun, funny, hilarious send up of the witch stories. It's set in uh, 1618 in Germany. And we've got this older woman who has just been living her life. And, you know, she has a son who's, she has two sons. One's who's very famous. He's a, an astronomer and he ends up being a, a very famous man uh, in, in, in tr truly. So th these are based on real characters and real events, but she does it in such a funny light way that that it's so comical it almost feels like you're reading like a real housewives edition um it's super gossipy and there's all of these uh, interviews of these people in her village who are accusing her of being a witch uh, and she doesn't really understand the danger that's that's upon her she's in her 70s and she's more concerned about other things. And so she just kind of like fluffs it off. Uh, and then it just continues on. Uh, and there are just some outrageous characters and people who say the craziest things. And, and then you start to see how this village is kind of turning on conspiracy theories and turning on, you know, one person said one thing and then another person starts to look at it and question it. And then all of a sudden it, it gains steam. I thought it was super, super clever. It speaks so, so well to the current uh, conspiracy theory type of environment that we're living in today uh, and, uh, and about groupthink and about people who take advantage of these moments uh, to settle scores or to uh, to get out of things that they are that they owe uh, it was, I, I thought this was fun. I did it in audio, which was even better. Uh, it, it was it was a light, fun, enjoyable read. Or listen, I guess I should say. Then, this one was a roller coaster, a gut punch, and um, 
what I ended up feeling was an exercise in in manipulating the reader. Hmm. Read this with my In Real Life book club because we are reading the Women's Prize shortlist. This is No One Is Talking About This by Patricia Lockwood. Now, uh, this book. I almost DNF'd this book. Uh, so it's told in like these snippet form. Let me kind of show what I mean. It's just these little chunky little vignette, little moments, little uh, snippets of pithy, witty, snarky, snide um, takes on the internet and internet culture. And as we put these together, we start to see the woman who is writing this. She is someone who has become obsessed with the portal, i.e. at the internet, and became famous for just some ludicrous saying uh, or question she asked uh, and created a meme about, which was, uh, can dogs have be twins? And, and then all of a sudden she's an expert on uh, kind of the zeitgeist of, of the moment with, with internet culture and she's flying all these places and she's talking at symposiums and she's uh, always trolling the internet looking for the next little bit, the next thing to, to make fun of or to poke at or, or, and it's all the most superficial surface uh, engagement. Uh, it's but it's very, it, it's written in a way that's very interesting. And you can see things that you're like, ha yeah, there you go. Uh, I get that. I get that joke. Um, and, but it's the remove uh, is, gives you such a, or at least made me feel so uncomfortable uh, because you don't know anything about her. There's no, there's very, very little detail. You know, she has uh, a sister, you know, that she's married. We don't know very little about her relationship with her husband, how she feels or thinks. She's literally just doom scrolling and looking for something to make fun of or something to, uh, to point everyone to. Uh, so I almost DNF'd it. I almost called my, my friends in my, my in real life book club and said, I can't. You know, I was already having such a crap week and the AQI is horrible here. So I'm fe I just feel exhausted and run down and, and cranky. And this was not helping my mood. But then uh, one of my friends beat me to the punch and she sent a text saying, I cannot wait to talk about this with you. And I thought, oh crap, now I'm going to finish it. <laughs> because there's something here to talk about, right? So I said, oh, okay, well, I'll just skim. So there's a twist that happens. I, I don't want to spoil it for anybody who may want to read it, but there's a twist that happens uh, that is the purpose of it is to humanize this woman. But the means through which she becomes she becomes humanized and, and reaches some emotional senses is is uh, I felt crass and uh, exploitative and ultimately really upsetting really upsetting and i didn't and it was it was it didn't i didn't buy it it felt performative the entire book felt performative the act of writing the book ultimately felt performative and that's because as we were talking about it uh one of my girlfriends said well this is based on real life this is based on something that actually happened to her Y'all, I was aghast. I was, I was actually aghast. So the the thing that is that bothers me about this book so much is that is the you the the way the manipulation of making this person so gross at the beginning, and you're just you know just feeling like they just make fun of. There's nothing that they're not going to make fun of or poke at or or feel righteous about. And then, and then all of a sudden this, this emotional like tsunami hits you. I will admit that I sobbed, but I, it, that sobbing was for the situation and, and the situation we're in now. It speaks so much to things that are going on right now in the United States that I 
I, I don't know if I would have had the same reaction in a different time. I, I would hope I, I would be able to still clearly look at the, the content and the text and, and the intent of the book. But ultimately, I feel like it's not enough that she's a great wordsmith and clever. She can, she can create a clever turn of phrase. Uh, for me, there was nothing that was additive or, or built up into something. Uh, the redemptive arc was, was lacking specifically because what she was supposed to end up feeling at the end was supposed to be uh, so powerful and important. Uh, but the act of writing about it feels like we've returned back to the beginning and now we're performing again. So, yeah, I'm going to think more about this because I think I have a blog post that I'd like to write about this. Uh, Brandon Taylor, who wrote Real Life and Filthy Animals, did a an essay about, immora- about moral and immoral literature. And in it, he talked about immoral literature is liter is, is writing that puts its finger on the scale to manipulate you. And that is 100% what I felt about this book. I felt completely manipulated throughout the entire thing. And I resent that. I, I, I'm an adult and I can, I understand nuance and I can understand and I can hold multitudes of, of, uh, competing thoughts in my head at the same time. And I just resented uh, this book so much, (laughs) so much. So yeah, if this wins the women's prize, I will be bummed. I will be so bummed. Anyway, that's that one. (laughs) I'm sure there's going to be a lot of uh, contention about that statement, but I look forward to, uh, to your thoughts on if you've read that book. Uh, but as we, if you do leave comments, let's try not to leave spoilers, if, if we can, please, because uh, I think that would be really difficult. If you want to talk more about it, uh, DM me in my Instagram account and we can have a, a conversation there. All right, then I needed a palate cleanser because that was so upsetting. So I picked something for Shorty September that, I mean, as you can see, it's tiny, 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 itty bitty. Uh, this is a Persephone edition of Cheerful Weather for the Wedding by Julia Strashley. I think I'm saying that right. Um, and I had found this in the used bookstore with the, the accompanying uh, bookmark, which is delightful. So this was first published by Hogarth Press, which was Leonard and Virginia Woolf's publishing company. Uh, and there, this is set in, it feels like a play because it's set in this home on the day of a wedding. And you have all of these characters that are kind of moving in and out of these different rooms in this in this home, uh, getting ready for the wedding. And uh, all sorts of different uh, conflicting needs of the, of the people. And at the heart of it is a love story that has been, uh, the seed has not matured. And so it's a, will she, or she's, she's thinking about somebody else and wondering if she's making the right decision. And uh, he is in the home at that moment downstairs. Uh, Some of it felt very reminiscent of uh, Mrs. Dalloway regarding Clarissa and Richard and, and the, their kind of expectations of each other and the conversation. So I, I really liked that, that illusion. And I'm not sure which came first, Mrs. Dalloway or this one, uh, but it was just, it was exactly what I wanted to take my mind off of that. Uh, there was a twist that happened that I'm still thinking about, and I'm still not sure, was it said in spite or was it true? So without spoiling this one, if you could let me, if you've read this and you know what I'm talking about, let me know. Do you think it was said in spite or do you think it actually did happen? I'm, I'm still not sure. Uh, but this was a, a good, delightful, great way for me to kick off Shorty September. Then I picked another. I was on a roll. This was a Friday night. Uh, Willa Cather's My Mortal Enemy. Uh, this is also itty bitty tiny. And I really like Willa Cather's writing. She's very sparse. She's very simple, but there is a lot packed in there. 
uh, this is the story of a a young woman named Mer- a, a woman named Myrna who gave up uh, a, a, a richness and and fortune in order to marry based on love and where that marriage has gone. And it's told through the eyes of a niece uh, named Nellie. And Nellie is kind of introduced to her aunt who had moved away and was living in New York City. Uh, And she's introduced to her when she's like 15 years old. She's always heard stories about this aunt and and she's really uh, kind of taken with her because she's a forceful personality. And she and her mother then go and visit uh, her aunt and uncle and are unwittingly pulled into something that uh, to be, in essence, conspirators on something that they did not understand uh, between between the the married couple, between Marta and her husband, Oswald. And it's it's really the story of a marriage and all the disappointments and the ways that it can go wrong. Uh, I, I enjoyed it. It's tiny. I mean, it's, it, it could actually be a short story, I think. Um, but I, I definitely enjoyed it. There's a, there's, there's some, and obviously great writing, uh, but there's some interesting characters in, in here that I, that I think will stay with me for a little while. Then lastly, I listened to an audio book. Uh, this was Almond by Shun Won Hyun and translated by Yun Sun Lee. I, I, one of the things I wanted to talk about at, at this really quick moment is I have in the past, I have mis, m- misordered the, the names, uh, Korean names. So Korean names are the family name first, what we would say last name, and then the first name. But I wanted to, to let you know in Goodreads, if you are looking and scrolling at the book, the book will have the Americanized version. So it will have the first name and then the last name. But that's not how they do it. We should not be doing that. If you, but ironically, if you go to the author page, the author page has it written correctly. So keep that in mind. Even though your, your copy, your Americanized copy, if you're, if you're American, or your Westernized copy may have the name done uh put in the wrong order. So it's just something to think about if you're talking about the books or if you're sharing about the books. Uh, Just an interesting tidbit. So this book is, I did it in audio, and it's about a boy who's kind of growing up, and it's about from the time he's very young to his his teen years. And he has alexamethia, which is a brain condition. It's not autism, and it's not... Asperger's. It's a different condition, but in essence, he does not sense emotion. He doesn't get emotion and he doesn't feel emotion. And we have, he's raised by his mother and his grandmother and his mother, as you can imagine, was devastated by the, by the uh, diagnosis and made a determination that she was going to teach him how to live in the world. And so she would put post-it no- notes everywhere about how to react in a situation so that so that he was appropriate, so he wasn't bullied, or that he could be more engaged in the world and and participate, and not be so isolated and shunned. And uh, it just be- that relationship so beautiful, so kind. There's an incident that happens uh, that shakes his world upside down. And it brings in some new characters to his world. And one of them asks him to do a favor. This man is a friend of his mother's and has been asked to look after and take care of him. So when he, when he asks for, for uh, our main character, who is Yung Jae, to do this favor for him and his, and his uh, professor friend, uh, he thinks about it and doesn't see anything wrong with it. Uh, but this actually opens up a, an entirely different world to him uh, that is uh, a, a very difficult for him to navigate and brings in new people that really test him in interesting ways. I thought this was a really interesting book. I didn't know where it was going to go. I didn't know uh, I didn't know how it was going to uh, develop and 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 I was surprised at many points in this book. 
Now, it is a little brutal. There is violence uh, here uh, because of, of his inability to feel fear and, and pain and, em and emotions like that. that. That's one of the things that is, is uh, heightened in this book. Uh, so keep that in mind. But overall, I, I thought this was a was a really really well well worth my time. So I enjoyed that very much. Okay, let's talk about what I'm currently reading. As always, Proust, In Search of Lost Time, Volume Three, Gramatis Way, still making progress. Then I have started Catalan Street by Magda Zabo, and this was translated by Len Ricks. I'm reading this with Natalie of A Curious Reader, and so this will be our second Magda Zabo book together and just had our, my first check-in, so I won't say any more so she has time to walk, to listen to that. And then Leo and I are starting our next Anita Bruckner. This is Incidents in the Rue Logier. Hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, and I'm so excited to say this is very different. She has a wide cast of characters. She's taking, uh, taking us into like a, a different world. It's in France, not in the in the UK from for most of the sections that we're in right now. So, oh, Anita, I'm I'm pleasantly surprised so far. So I'm gonna have my first check-in with Leo soon. We're gonna check in at the halfway mark. So that's exciting. And then I have a huge stack of books for Shorty September that I'm just slowly making my way through, which is wonderful. And I have tomorrow off. So I have an extra reading day uh, to enjoy. So that's it for me for now. Uh, I would love to know, have you read any of these books? Uh, what were your thoughts? And I hope that you stay safe, stay healthy. Remember, we're still in a global pandemic. And as I always say, please maintain safe social distance, wear your mask, wash your hands, and don't touch your face. And that's it. I'll look forward to talking to you uh, very soon. Bye.